We got a special morning for you planned. It's been an incredible weekend so far. All I'm really doing is just preaching the Bible for about a half an hour. Is that cool? And I want to encourage you, you know, before I get into it, anybody got any uh, busted brackets in here? Yeah, okay, we'll pray for you. But can, can we celebrate? Uh, it's not every time I do this, Boiler fans, if there's a, ever a week to come to church, this is it. You guys look dominant yesterday, and I have said this at every service. This is a testament to anyone interested in serving the Lord with their life. Brad Smith came last night during the Michigan game and volunteered to run sound here at our church, and the Lord rewarded him with the victory. So Michigan, and I have said we will never celebrate the Wolverines ever again in this place, so, place of the Lord, but... Uh, we do want to welcome you, no matter if your bracket is busted or not, we want to tell you about the great provider. And that's what this week is all about, how the Lord provides for us. If you'll turn in your Bibles, open up the one in your book rack, or power on your Bible, and turn to Leviticus chapter 23, as we continue our seven-week teaching series called Party Like a Rabbi, Jesus and the Jewish Festivals, which I just noticed a few minutes ago, also known as Jesus and the Uish festivals, in case <laughs> for any of the ADD people in the room, you can think about that for the next 30 minutes. But <laughs> we have seen over the last uh, several weeks how the New Testament and Jesus in particular often fulfills many of these Old Testament festivals or parties. These were instituted in Leviticus 23 for them to celebrate, to remember different things. We looked at the Passover, Festival of Unleavened Bread. We looked, you remember the last time we studied this uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Glenn was here last weekend, but two weeks ago, we looked at the Festival of First Fruits. And the whole concept was that you gave over the first 10% of your crops, trusting that the Lord was going to provide for you. And then what God did is he instituted a festival you would do 50 days after the Passover, as we'll see in a moment, called the Festival of Weeks, where you would come and See how God had provided for you. These festivals revolved around the Jewish agricultural calendar. We've even got a chart that gives you the dates if you want to write them down or get a quick picture of that. The spring festivals were surrounded around the spring harvest. And you'll notice the big gap between first fruits and the weeks. The festival of weeks was after the spring harvest. You have prayed for the spring rains to be provided and that God would provide for you physically with crops. And that you would have everything you need and then some. And that's what the festival week's uh, celebration was all about. You would start planning it long before the crops had been come in and been harvested. And you were counting on that the Lord would provide for you for your physical needs. We'll also see over time it came to not just be about physical provision, but the Festival of Weeks was about spiritual provision. And that they celebrated the giving of the Ten Commandments and the law. And so you were reminded year after year, that day, every year in the spring, you come together, you would celebrate the festival, remind how God provided for you both physically and spiritually. In a couple of weeks in the Festival of Tabernacles, the fall festival, we're going to see some similarities even. But I want to share with you, before we dive into Leviticus 23, this one is uh, personal to me. I'm going to warn you, I'm just teaching the Bible this week. Uh, imagine that. And we're going to allow the weight of it to sink in. When you see how this festival is fulfilled in the New Testament, I believe that you're going to be blown away. And that today we as Christians have the role of the Holy Spirit in our life. Anyone have the Holy Spirit up in here? A few of you guys. Yeah, so I didn't grow up in a church that really talked about that kind of stuff. And uh, we obviously aren't the, the zany church, but I, I just want to encourage you, you know, if you're like me and you hear people talk about catching the Holy Ghost and you're like, what? <laughs> this week is for you. And I want to demonstrate how God's provision from humankind through the Holy Spirit was begun many generations before. I can't wait to show it to you. And it's personal to me because I believe that we're all sitting here today because about nine years ago, I was on the floor of this little hotel room on my knees praying and believed the Holy Spirit, not audibly, 
but that the Holy Spirit spoke to me to move our family to Indiana and start a church, and three friends of mine from high school would help us. We were living in Southern California at the time, and that sounded just as nuts then as it does today. And many of you guys know the story, and I'm going to share a little of the details of the background of that. But we moved here from Indiana to do this about eight and a half years ago, officially started the church seven and a half years ago, and it's been an amazing, wild ride. But sometimes it's when we're at our lowest of our lows, when we are our weakest, that God could be the strongest and bring hope to others around us. And that's at the heart of the Festival of Weeks and what I'd like to share with you. Are ready to study God's word together? Come on now. It says this in verse 15, Leviticus 23. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. How many weeks? Seven. Okay, that's seven times seven, 49 plus one, verse 16. Count off 50 days. How many days? Okay, we all track in. 50 is going to be kind of an important number here. If you want to underline, highlight that on Evernote, circle it if you got the Bible in your book rack out. It's cool. You can mark it up. But 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. And then here was how you worship the Lord. He dictated how you would do it on the festival of weeks. You would bring grain with you. You would also, verse 17, from wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two tents that will fall of the finest flour. He doesn't want your junky old flour. He wants the good stuff, baby. He says, bring not just that, but uh, it's going to be baked with yeast. Now, that might not seem significant, but remember, up until now, everything had always been unleavened bread. Remember? No yeast. I don't have time for the dough to rise. And yeast represented luxury and abundance. So on this festival, he says, you're going to even going to have some yeast. That dough is going to rise, baby, nice and fluffy and soft. And you're going to eat it. Remember how I cared for you and provided for you. You had to plan this festival long before the crops had come in. You had given up your first 10% of your crops and trusted I would provide for you. As, end of verse 17, as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. Verse 18, present with this bread, you ready to track all this stuff, seven male lambs, each a year old without defect. That's going to hit the pocketbook. One young bull and two rams. They will be a burnt offering to the Lord together with their grain offerings and drink offerings of food aro- offering and aroma pleasing to the Lord. Then, we're not done yet, sacrifice one male goat for a sin offering and two lambs, each a year old, for a fellowship offering. The priest is to wave the two lambs, is where it gets weird, before the Lord as a wave offering, which was one of the ways that they did offerings in the Old Testament, together with the bread of the first fruits. They are a sacred offering to the Lord for the priest. On that same day, you are to proclaim a sacred assembly and do no regular work. This is to be a lasting ordinance for generations to come wherever you live, up to the point where we will see the fulfillment of that by the end of our time together. But finally, verse 22, when you reap the harvest of your land, when did you start planting this? Weeks before the harvest was ever there, trusting that the spring rains would come and that there would be crops to harvest. You're planting a festival to celebrate the harvest that God would bring. Do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. Two things. The first one, if we had more time, there's a whole sermon just about leaving the edges of your crop for the poor or the foreigner. Part of God's twofold mission is to help those in need. And as a Christian, we are called to help those in need and to share our faith. And so even all the way back then in the Festival of Weeks, they had a way of providing that. But the second thing I want you to notice there is the amount of stuff God is requiring of you to bring with you to the Festival of Weeks. So picture this, right? You get the kids and you're packing up the minivan. You get them all strapped in. You pop open the gate and you start throwing everything into the back with the gate up. And here's the list of stuff that you got to throw in there. Picture it with me. First some grain, then two loaves, then a wave offering, then seven male lambs, right? After like the fourth or the fifth lamb of trying to get this to fit into the back of the minivan... Wouldn't you be going, where did I get all this stuff from? You may have never experienced this, but parents, you know this. Just go look at the toy room in your house. 
where did all this cover you? You packing in the seventh lamb, you finally get all that in there, and then one bowl, two rams, grain offering, drink offering, male goat, two more lambs. Almost as if God's trying to teach you something to remind you you had to plan this party weeks ago. You gave your first 10% of your crops. You had to trust me and believe I was going to provide for you. Now look at all this. As every moment, as you're cramming the last thing in there, you're reminded of how God took care of you. That was at the heart of the festival of weeks. And some of you have, may have walked in here and not been in a church in years or decades or ever. Some of you have, may have come in here with a lot of pain and baggage at your lowest of your lows struggling with addictive habit, a broken relationship, financial struggles, going, God, does he even care about me? This weekend, through the festival of weeks and God's fulfillment of it in the New Testament, I want you to see that the God that created the universe, that, that literally keeps the world, the earth, spinning on its axis as it revolves around the sun in alignment with all of the planets working in orbit, that the God that held all that together knitted you together in your mother's womb, and he cares about the argument you had with your friend on the phone yesterday. That the God that created the universe cares that you couldn't pay your visa bill last month. Then all is awe-inspiring power and wonder that we're going to look at in a moment. He deeply is concerned for you, right where you are, to be your sustainer and your provider. That's at the heart of the Festival of Weeks. Let's pray. God, uh, we just pause, and I thank you for all, man, all these people coming out in the middle of March to worship you, to study Leviticus 23. And yet we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to us, that the Holy Spirit that hovered over the waters in the creation of the world in the book of Genesis, that that same Holy Spirit is in the room with us where two or more are gathered right now. God, we pray that you would speak to us. Bring hope in our weakness. Where we are weak, may you become strong. Speak to us, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your name and all God's family said, amen. Amen. You know, a lot of you have heard the story of us moving to plant the church, maybe, and you may know some of the details I'm about to share of some of the backstory, but maybe you don't. It wasn't actually all that easy. First of all, my wife is from Southern California. She grew up in the Valley. Anybody remember the TV show Saved by the Bell? Some of you guys out there, I'm going to date myself a little bit, you know, like the whole Valley Girls thing, like those are real people. It's my wife. She gets on the phone, and she literally, like, her voice changes instantly with a friend of hers that's from Nevada. They'll be like, totally. I can't even believe it. Like, you got to pause and enunciate. Like, that's how they talk. I'm not making it up. So she's not from here. I grew up in a small town in Indiana, and I had been in California for seven years. We're going to a large church there, and we thought we'd be there forever. And she turned to me one week, and she goes, Josh, if you ever think about moving to Indiana, it's not going to happen. Don't bring it up. <laughs> and I was like, I've been to Indiana. The weather's nicer here. We're staying. And then I actually, um, I brought her back to visit my parents, and we went to a small county fair. I won't mention the name of the county, but we were up at the Howard County Fair <laughs> here in Indiana. And for the first time, I'm not making it up, like it's the first time in her life, she didn't think this was real. She saw like mullets and stuff. <laughs> now I'm not making this up, don't judge me. I came from a small town. Like she, she literally thought that was something they made up for the movies, for like Joe Dirt or some of those movies, you know? She didn't know it was a real thing. So she saw, she's like, Josh, I would never fit in here. I'm never going to move. And I was like, honey, chill out. It's not going to ever happen. It was six months after she told me that. I had this prayer where I believe the Holy Spirit spoke to me and we should move our family to Indiana and start a church. <laughs> and so I told her and she was like, oh, you heard wrong. Lord did not say that. <laughs> no, she, she actually prayed about it. And the next day she was like, let's do it. I want to tell you that when God enters into your life and the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it can be life changing for you. And then it, was, you know, it wasn't all that easy. We moved here to start the church, and 
We found out our unborn son had a genetic disorder, and we didn't have uh, health insurance at the time. We thought it would transfer, and it didn't. And then, you know, he was supposed to die in the womb. Many of you guys know the story. I'll do it quickly. And he ended up being born, and he lived two weeks and then passed away. We grieved for a month, and I wouldn't do any church planting stuff. And then we came back and got to work, except for, you know, my wife carried Jackson in her womb for nine months. So it was, the grieving process did not end after a month. It's still going on. And so through that process, we began to go, God, what in the world are you doing? And then we launched the church services, and a few of you guys in the room were there in those days. And up here at uh, Clay Middle School here in Carmel, amazing facility. It holds 550 people, and we instantly packed that space out and went to two services. And then we had an abundance of financial resources and tons of volunteers. No. (laughs) None of that happened. There was like 70 of us in this humongous room for about a year standing around. You know what happened, though? We started reaching a few people who didn't have anyone in their life telling them about Jesus. And it radically changed their lives. And then we couldn't meet in the school anymore. It had been a year, so we had to find a space. You can only stay in a school here in Carmel for one year. So we found this little lease facility off of College Avenue. It only had 5,000 square feet of usable weekend space. That, <laughs> that's smaller than some of your homes. And we moved the church there. And, and a lot of the, my coaches and experts did, like, told that this is a bad idea. Like, you know, rich people from Hamilton County aren't going go, uh, to go to that space. And literally our kids' ministry was meeting in, like, office, offices. It was like a converted office space. And it was really weird. It was actually a step up from, like, the play panel divider pig pens we had had at the uh, school. But we got up there and we did it anyway. And you know what started happening is the Holy Spirit of God began to minister and work even more. And our second birthday celebration, there was a turning point. We saw a bunch of people from that community come to Christ, and 12 people got baptized in a horse trough that day. And then all of a sudden, God just started moving, and, and, and it wasn't anything we did, really. I, I want to be honest. This is why this is so personal to me, because we were so still hurting in that time. It was like the Spirit of God used that weakness to allow him to show up more. And people started having their lives changed, and people started hearing about it. And the next thing I know, like within a year, we got people sitting on the floor. We didn't have seats for everybody. We were doing five services at one point in that little building, people parking in the grass and the mud. In the snow, people walking multiple blocks just to get there, you know. In the megachurch world, that's like, I'm not coming back. But they just kept coming. And and the next thing, we're like, well, we got to do something. We can't keep doing this forever. So we're like, well, we need to find a space to meet. And somebody showed me this building. I was like, no, we're young, poor people. We can't afford that. And yet God provided a way in this miraculous thing within a short period of time. We moved over here, closed on the purchase of this property four years to the date. On the day of my son's birthday that passed away. And I always look at that. It wasn't planned by any means. We kind of figured it out like the day of. I always look at that as God demonstrating because that night he was born was the lowest moment of my life. And we saw his condition and just like, God, why? We can't take anymore. And four years later, he said, hey, look back. Look how I used your weakness. And I want to encourage you today, if you're here and you are struggling and your relationships are a mess and your finances are a mess and your workplace or your school stuff is a mess and you wake up every day mad at the world, I've been there and God can use that weakness and when you're at your lowest of your lows, he can groan for you and that's what I want to show you through the festival of weeks and God's fulfillment in the New Testament. I believe it's a life-changing, powerful moment. And it's actually goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 19, it's not going to be on your screen, but I want you to open it up just for a moment because I think if you see this, it, there should be a Bible in the book rack in the chair there. And I'm not going to read it. I'm only going to read one verse to you. But in Exodus 19 and 20, they get the Ten Commandments. And the two passages that they would read as they would celebrate the festival of weeks was Exodus 19 and 20 about the giving of the Ten Commandments And Ezekiel chapter 1. And I just want to read a small snippet of both of those sections. In Exodus chapter 19, you know the story. It says, on the first day of the third month, what month was the festival of weeks in? Third month. After the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. Maybe you've seen a movie about it. 
And they get there in the wilderness. They're looking for what to do. And God shows up on Mount Sinai, and he gives them the Ten Commandments. And there's this wondrous moment. And if you look at Exodus chapter 20, it lists the Ten Commandments. And maybe you read those and you go, I could never fulfill those and live like that. Well, that was kind of the idea. The idea was that you're going to need God to help you become the person you were created to be. He needs to be your sustainer and your provider. I don't know where we got this idea like that Old Testament God is like angry, judgmental God with lots of rules. And then like New Testament God is all love and grace, like hippie God, right? It's the same God in the Old and New Testament. You can find tons of mercy and grace in the Old Testament. And read the book of Revelation, man. You can find tons of judgment in the New Testament. And when you get to Exodus chapter 20, it gives you the Ten Commandments. The idea was that you're going to need God to sustain you to live this way. And then God shows up. And on the mountain there, you see the power of God. If you're taking notes, the big idea, if you haven't caught on, is that God provides. Pretty simple. And the first point I'd like to make, and I'll move really quickly, is this. God has the power to provide. When do we make God like such a wimpy, like apathetic God? Somebody compared him in the prayer room uh, last service to like, you know, the baby Jesus. It's like he always stayed a baby in our mind. He is empathetic. He is caring and concerned for our needs, but he is not apathetic. And he is not wimpy, some wimpy God that you can control and dictate to. He's the type of God, when you are in his presence, there is only one way to respond. And I want to show you in both passages we're going to read how they respond. It's with fearful reverence. Because his power and might is so, so majestic. Look in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. It says, or excuse me, verse 17, then Moses has led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain, verse 18. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. Can you picture it? Wouldn't that freak you out a little bit? Fire on the mountain? Now, I'm going to encourage you sometimes, yes, in the story of Elijah, he's in the still small voice of the Lord, absolutely. He didn't have to approach like this, but don't think it's because he doesn't have the power to do it. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the, the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not speak, uh, do not have God speak to us, verse 19. Do not have God speak to us or we will die. They're so fearful in that moment where God shows up with fire and smoke and lightning on the mountain that they're, please don't speak God or we're going to fall and die. Now turn to Ezekiel chapter 1, the other passage that they would have read as they celebrated the festival of weeks. In Ezekiel chapter 1, by the way, if you've never read Ezekiel 1, it's from the prophet Ezekiel, and he's going to uh, have this moment where he's in the throne room of God. He's going to try and make sense of it with human words, but he can't totally do it. So he uses all of this imagery to describe it, and it's incredible. You ever want to have a freaky moment, like stay up really late at night, eat some like spoiled pizza, drink a bunch of caffeine... And then at like 3 in the morning, crack open the book of Ezekiel and read it cover to cover. <laughs> it's going to freak you out, man. Because when they get in the throne room of God and there's a seraphim flying around the angels, and then this happens right here in verse 25. Then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli, and high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. It's going to be the presence of God. If you want to picture it as God incarnate Jesus, that's fine. But it's this moment where God is there. Verse 27, I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal as if full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounding him. The only words he described, there's like light surrounding him. He's like glowing metal. He's got pants of fire on. That'd freak you out, wouldn't it? And then the verse right after it, it says, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, what did he do? I fell face down, and I heard the voice of the one speaking. Even the prophet Ezekiel, the only thing he can do is lay his face on the ground out of reverent fear for the Lord. Number one, if you're taking notes, God has the power to provide. If you feel helpless and weak and hopeless in this life, go to the one provider who has the power and the authority to do something about it. 
Now, certainly hear me. If your marriage is struggling, go to Christian marriage counseling. If you're struggling with addictive habits, get a support group. Seek medical help if you need. Take all of those steps. Absolutely. If you're physically hurt or you have a sickness, go to a doctor, find a surgeon, do all of those things. But also turn to the great supernatural provider and receive from him in your life. Now, for me, as someone who, uh, I mean, I came to Christ in a fraternity house, the message like this would have totally freaked me out. <laughs> I'd have been like, this, this is crazy. But then read the New Testament. They are reading Ezekiel 20 in this amazing fire mountain scene, and then they read uh, it's, it's me, Exodus 20, and then they read Ezekiel 1, and the pants of fire and the whole glowing metal thing fall down on my face out of fear. And they would do that every time they celebrated this festival. And I want to show you on one particular year when they were celebrating the Jewish festival of weeks, what occurred. And I think it's going to blow your mind. See, God doesn't just have the power to provide. Number two, if you're taking notes, God provides the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit for us. You remember when the temple curtain is torn in two? When Jesus, who was the Passover lamb that was uh, through his crucifixion, no longer are we just forgiven for one year like the Passover lamb had been, but now we are forgiven for all time. To tell us that it's paid in full. All your wrongdoing, all your brokenness, guilt, and shame can be taken away because of the work of Jesus on the cross. And in that moment, the book of Matthew tells us that the temple curtain is torn in two. And no longer does the Spirit of God reside in a box in this back room in a building. But now where does it reside? The New Testament teaches us that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It resides in those who receive the forgiveness and grace of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in their life. And the first time it is given to humankind, does anybody know where it happens? Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. God provided the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Does anybody know what the word pent means in Greek? You can probably guess it by now. Five, yes, but it means in Pentecost, it means 50. 50. It was 50 days after the Passover lamb would have been brought into the home. What would they have been celebrating 50 days after that? The Festival of Weeks. You can look this up later on. Like, this isn't really disagreed upon with New Testament scholars. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, 50 days later, they were all together in one place. Why were they all in one place? They were celebrating the festival like they did every single year. And they would read Ezekiel 20 and 19 about the fire on the mountain and the thunder and the lightning. And they read, uh, I mean, Exodus 19 and 20. They'd read Ezekiel chapter 1 about the fire that happened in that moment. And then this happened. Now, I want you to picture in this room for just a moment. You're in the house that on the day of Pentecost when this occurs. And you've just read those two passages this would totally freak you out, man. Look what it says here. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house They were sitting where they were sitting. Verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What? You just read those two passages and then that presence of God, the power of God, wouldn't that freak you out? And so then naturally, everybody who saw it occur went, oh, the presence of the Lord has anointed them. It has come upon thee. No. They go, these people had to be drinking. <laughs> they were boozing it up. That's what happened. No, look, it actually says, I'm not making this up. It says it in the Bible. Look at verse 15. It says, these people are not drunk. <laughs> they got to clarify it. As you suppose, it's only nine in the morning. Well, maybe for some, but that's not what's going on here. He said, something has occurred. And then he goes on and he describes it this way. No, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And this is where it's about to get real heavy, and I, and I want the weight of this to sink in. See, the Bible is full of all of these biblical prophecies, and we, we don't talk about it all the time, but it's, it's all over the place, about God enacting throughout time, declaring what's going to occur and thousands of years earlier, the festival of weeks had been given, saying that I am your great provider and your sustainer, and that you are, have been given the law to help you learn how to live your life in a holy way. You have been 
given the crops every year that I've provided and sustained to take care of you. And after all these years of waiting, God, in one particular day, at one particular moment in time, on the day of the festival of weeks, finally gives once and for all the fulfillment of it, the role of the Holy Spirit is given to all those who receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and receive his Holy Spirit into their life. I took a bit of planning, don't you think? And God, all the way back then, didn't want you to doubt. He wanted to just demonstrate so clearly that you could know without a shadow of a doubt that he really is your sustainer, your advocate, your counselor, your provider. And when that happens, everything changes. See, Joel, the prophet says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and the billows of smoke. Uh, I want to tell you, we're not the place that's like, the end times is upon us. You need to turn or burn. You know, it's time to get your life in order. uh, None of that's going on today, so chill out for a second. But you better believe that the New Testament definitely teaches that once Jesus was crucified, rose on the third day, and the gift of the Holy Spirit was given, that the last days had begun. And we don't know if the last day will be today or tomorrow or a thousand years from now or a million years from now. We don't know. And it's not our job to know. That's God's job. But we know we're one day closer than we've ever been to the return of Jesus. And that he has given us signs so that we could know in our culture today where there is darkness and brokenness and anger and guilt and shame and hatred and animosity and war and people treating each other so poorly and more depression and anxiety rampant in our society than we can ever, at least that we're aware of in human history. That he gave us a provider, a sustainer, to help you when you're at your lowest of your lows. See the third and final point if you're taking notes is that he didn't just provide the Holy Spirit for us. He gave us the Holy Spirit because God provides hope in our weakness. The Holy Spirit is meant to bring hope in this dark world in your point of weakness when you're at your lowest of your lows. And when we were going through that, losing a child and all that stuff, people would look at us and go, How, why aren't you just angry? It's like, I am angry. And if I didn't have Christ in my life, I didn't have the Holy Spirit ministering to me during that time, I, I would have been a big mess. I guarantee you that. And, you know, most of you guys know me as a Christian, as a pastor, but there was a time I was not that. And I would not have responded to that situation that way. But it's because God is real. And His Holy Spirit is real. And sustained me and provided for me and took this mess, this weakness in my life and made it something that he could use for better, both in my life and the lives of those around me. And one of the verses that always took out to me is Romans 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You may have come in here today broken and weak. The Bible teaches us his Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes through us, through our wordless groans. It's talking about praying in the Spirit, yes, but it's also talking about when you're at your lowest of your woes, you can't even utter a word, the Spirit of God can groan for you because He cares for you. That's His will. It declares it in verse 27, and He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. His will is for the Spirit to intercede for us in our brokenness. That means if you came in on your last leg in your marriage, it's not over. You need to go to counseling, you need all that stuff, but you also need to turn to the one supernatural thing you have in your life, the Holy Spirit, to minister and to work and to bring strength and hope where there is weakness. My favorite verse on the Holy Spirit is Romans 15, 13, as we close out our time. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It says that in your weakness, he can provide and sustain and make you strong and the Holy Spirit in your life can overflow. Did you catch the word it used to describe it? It said hope, it said joy. 
I think sometimes, man, when I get run down and I get, to, I'll be honest, I've had kind of a snarky week. You ever have a snarky week where you just want to mouth off to everybody around you? I'm convinced if I didn't become a Christian, I'd be like the Ricky Gervais of Carmel. And yet, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life and radically changes you, in your brokenness and your weakness, He can be made strong. And it's only when you receive that into your life and it overflows in the lives around you, they experience the joy, actual joy in a world of brokenness and shame and anger and animosity and just turning on one another. They look at you and go, how, how could you live like that? And the answer is, I can't. I'm broken. But, but I know the one who can sustain me, can provide for me, that plan thousands of years earlier that you could know when I showed up, I wanted you to know I was right there with you every step of the way. That if you just leaned on me and allowed me to provide for you, the Holy Spirit could actually use your brokenness to help someone else. Because it's not just about you being provided for, it's about God overflowing in the lives of those around you. And when they see that, it spreads. You know what happened this week? 13 people in Rooted got baptized. And I'm, I'm just going to call some out. You know, I didn't ask permission. This will be fun. Like Dave's at this, this service. David was an atheist a few years ago. He gave his life to Christ. But, but get this. Then he baptized someone, just this two people in his rooted group, just this last week. So it's come full circle now. And there are other people that are going to get baptized. Samantha is going to get baptized right now, today, at the end of this service. And recently gave her life over to the Lord. I think a recommitment. Just and So you may be sitting here, and you may be at your lowest of your lows. Allow God to bring hope in your weakness. Turn to him. Receive his grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Receive his Holy Spirit. Live differently. The Bible teaches us when you do that, you instantly get baptized. You don't have to wait and get perfected first, because that's not going to happen until you get to heaven. Just go ahead and follow him. Jesus got baptized. Set the example. It represents you have died with Christ. You have risen with him. I have new life. I'm a new creation. I'm going to change and live for Lord. the Lord. And so if you're here today, you didn't plan on this at all, and you just came in your clothes, you got a suit and tie on, I don't care, you wore your trendy clothes, it's cool, we're going to dunk you if you want to be baptized and follow the Lord today. We'll send you home in your wet clothes if you want. I've done it many times. We once had a girl that was 19 or 18 years old and wanted to get baptized so badly, it was at the old building, we didn't have the horse trough filled up, so we filled up a plastic tub that was about this big, and she crunched down in it, and we baptized her in the tub. She went on a mission trip to Costa Rica recently. She'd been living for the Lord said. So I just want to encourage you, don't wait forever. Do something. Start living your life and allow him to use your weakness today. Can we do that? Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for this church and thank you for these people. And God, we don't want to be about a show or about anything, about planning and strategy and all that stuff. We just want to be about you and about you, Jesus, and about your work and your forgiveness, your grace. We thank you for your Holy Spirit in our lives that we could be provided for and taken care of. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, God. So we pray for your sustenance in our lives today. And maybe there's some people here that need to surrender their life fully to you to receive your Holy Spirit in their life. If that's you, I'm not going to make you do anything, but I want you to pray this with me silently as I pray it out loud. God, I confess I need you. Forgive me for my wrongdoing. I turn to you. I receive your grace and forgiveness. I repent of my wrongdoing and I surrender my life to you fully, Lord Jesus. I receive your Holy Spirit into my life, overflow in my world with the peace and joy that only you can provide. Be the hope in my weakness. I surrender everything to you. We love you, Jesus. We give you this church. We pray in your name and all God's family said, amen.